the notes here are the most most important as far as it's concerned. So, yes, uh, as Joshua just said, this is the beginning of our second unit uh, together in the first module where we're focusing on the epistles and the uh, fundamentals and mechanics in studying. And I just, you know, we're going to spend a few weeks now looking at uh, principles of grammar. We started that at the end of the last, uh, end of the last unit, and we're going to be taking a lot of time these next several weeks, just focusing on some some grammar principles. And uh, I just want to encourage us to remember that, uh, you know, these are part of the tools that we need to be effective in what we do, just like a carpenter needs certain tools to do his job correctly, right? A hammer and screwdriver and saw and, uh, you know, these kinds of tools uh, if, he, if he doesn't have them, he's not going to do a good job. And so as we desire to teach the Bible, to preach the Bible, to counsel others through the scripture, we, we really need to have all the tools to be the most effective. And so that means because scripture is a written, uh, it comes, you know, in a written form, and the original authors uh, used grammar to communicate truths, um, and the Holy Spirit works through our understanding of how they communicated those truths, and we really need to do our best and work at understanding the grammar, and and I'll, I'll repeat this I know many times, but uh, as we look at, our focus will be English grammar because we're using English translations, um, just to remember that there are many, much of that will overlap with uh, Greek grammar, which is what in the New Testament, anyway, the original text was written in. And so um, we're actually learning the gram grammatical principles, many of them that we learn directly apply and connect to uh, the language that the scripture was originally written in, uh, in many ways. And so uh, I think it, uh, it still will be of tremendous help to you. And the English translations we have are very good. Um, and so it's, uh, I think our effort to better understand English will, will pay off for you, will be helpful to you. And also, too, there's so many other resources that are in English uh, online, as well as written resources that, um, and books that will uh, also be a benefit. The better you are able to handle the English language, you'll be able to use those tools more effectively as well. And so Please uh, just stay with this. Um, some of these concepts we'll discuss may either be new to you or may be difficult. Um, some, hopefully, will just be a review for you. But overall, just want to encourage you to, to uh, endure um, through this second unit. And I think as you stay with it, you'll see the value of it as we continue to, to move through it. Okay? So... Uh, again, thank you for for being here the, tonight. Let's let's just dive right in. What I'd like to do tonight is sort of reconnect to the last uh, session from Unit One, and we'll review a little bit from that session, and then sort of continue on in uh, in our study from that session. And just remember the uh, sorry the. The steps that we're looking at to study an epistle, uh, we've covered the first three in detail, had some assignments related to that for Colossians. Uh, and the first three, again, are the focus is the book as a whole, understanding the occasion for the, the book or why the letter was written, understanding um, the flow of the letter, the purpose of it, what was the author's main point and how does he develop that? And then in the fourth step is when we begin to now narrow our focus down to um, a particular passage and how that passage fits within the book overall. And one of the key steps, if, if not, I think the most important step as far as the study, the exegesis, is the block diagram, because it is in this step that we really examine um, how the passage is structured and how each part of the passage fits within uh, within uh, itself. So 
this is a very important step, and this is why we're going to take some time to uh, really understand um, uh, grammar behind that, because the grammar is what will drive the diagram, and the diagram is what will help us see the outline of the passage. And knowing the outline of the passage will then help us in preaching the text. Then we'll be able to, again, expository preaching is simply explaining the author's intended meaning so that our hearers can understand and apply it. And so uh, to do that, we need to break down the passage using the author's uh, grammar, using grammar because that's what the author used in communicating those principles. Okay, so with that, we start with the basic building blocks. As I mentioned to you before, right, an epistle is made up of paragraphs, where again, each paragraph is a unit of thought. And as each unit of thought is connected together, the overall purpose and theme for the letter is made evident. Now, each paragraph, then, we can break down into at least one, usually there's more than one sentence, in that paragraph. So a particular unit of thought is expressed by uh, and in at least one, usually more sentences. Now, each sentence can be broken down. Each sentence is made up of smaller pieces called clauses and phrases. All right. And then uh, in unit 10, we, we even went one step further down where each clause and phrase is made up of the smallest units of Thoughts like nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. Now, those of you who are involved in chemistry or electronics maybe can appreciate the illustration of a, of a, of a molecule, right? Uh, you know, every, every substance is made up of multiple molecules, okay? And each molecule is made up of individual atoms within that molecule connected together. Each of those atoms, those of you who are experts in quantum physics, uh, I'm sure all of us have study that in detail, right? We have some quantum physics experts out there. Well, each atom is broken up into what are called subatomic particles. Um, uh, I studied those, oh, I don't know how many years ago. I've forgotten everything, but I remember at least that. So it's kind of the same idea where you have larger broken up into smaller pieces and smaller pieces. And it's the same in um, grammar. The uh, clause is made up of nouns and verbs as well as the phrase, adjectives and adverbs. Those are what are used to build sentences. Sentences build paragraphs, and paragraphs are what communicates the author's flow of thought within an epistle, okay? And so what I want to focus on tonight is, again, go back to the sentence. And we're going to look at the sentence level and spend a lot of time there because we want to understand what are the basic pieces of the sentence. That's what we're going to, in diagramming, that's what we're, uh, putting together is the clauses and phrases, okay? Not the individual words, but actually each phrase and clause uh, is what we're going to be connecting together, okay? So let's remind ourselves of a few uh, basic definitions here. Uh, first, let's remember the sentence is simply, uh, it presents a subject and something said about that subject, okay? That, that's all that a sentence is. There's a subject and then something said about the subject. That's called a predicate technically, but basically it's um, every sentence will contain at least a subject and a verb, all right? If you don't have a subject and a verb, you don't have a sentence. Often there will be more to it, such as an object uh, or other things, but the basic uh, foundation of a sentence is a subject and a verb that, uh, a, a subject being a noun which carries out an action or about which a statement is made, okay? So David kicked the ball. That's an action. David is the subject, and he's doing something, okay? That's one kind of um, uh, sentence. Another kind is where the subject isn't doing something, but something is said about the subject. David was tired, Again, David's still the subject. What is said about him is that he was tired. So these are two kinds of uh, ways that uh, describe a subject within a sentence, all right? And they are defined by or identified by 
the kind of verb that is used in relation to the subject. So we have a subject, that's a noun, person, place, or thing, which carries out an action or about which a statement is made. And we know which it is by what kind of verb is connected to the subject. So again, we have two kinds of verbs that we've been talking about. There's the verb of action, where the subject's doing something, and there's the verb of being, where the subject is something, okay? Now, there are more technical terms used. I'm just using these terms verb of action and verb of being, but there's, there's more technical grammatical terms, but those aren't helpful really. So just think about it in this way. There, in, in English, there are two kinds of verbs. Those verbs which describe an action being done by the subject and those verbs which describe the subject itself, something about the subject. Okay? So this is very important that you understand this. All right. And then at any time, guys, uh, always you can ask, ask a question or if you have a comment or, or something you want to let me know. Please feel free to just raise your hand or let me know that. But uh, so far, this is things we've been, uh, we looked at before. So I'm just looking at this by way of review. Okay, so when we consider both of these kinds of verbs, there's the verb of action. And when you have a verb of action, often it will take on an object, something that receives that action. It's the recipient of the action. So for example, David kicked the ball, right? The ball is receiving the action in this case. David is a subject. His, the verb is a verb of action. He's doing something. And what he's doing is he kicked the ball. And so there'll be, there's an object here receiving that action. Okay, that's the verbs of action. Now, verbs of being, there's no action happening. So there's no object. If there's no action, there's nothing receiving an action, right? And so in this case, for a verb of being, uh, there often will be a word that follows it, which uh, it's called a, a predicate, adjective, or noun. But basically, just think of it as the word that's describing the subject. That's all it is. Okay, so, and there's two kinds. There's a, an adjective or, or a noun. So, for example, David was tired. Okay, this is a, a verb of being. It's describing a state a condition, and that condition of the subject Oops, sorry about sorry, that. Sorry, Tim, we lost you. No problem. You yeah, all right? The internet cut off on me. <laughs> okay. Or somebody was really bored, so they just... Uh... <laughs> 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 but I've had enough of this English stuff. <laughs> All right, I apologize for that. Don't worry. Um, so we, we, I was uh, discussing the verb of being, and that usually there's a word which follows that kind of verb, and that word is what's describing the subject. Again, remember, two kinds of sentences, those which the subject is doing something, and the, those kinds of sentences where the subject is something. And... The is something is a verb of being, and in this case, David was tired. Now, tired is not a noun, it's an adjective, but there are also verbs of being which are followed by a noun, okay? But in each case, both are just describing the subject. So we have David was tired, that's an adjective. Philip is a pastor, pastor is a noun, okay? But both of these sentences are functioning the same way. They're simply describing the subject. Okay, so far so good. All right, now, as I mentioned to you before, the, a sentence is made up of clauses and phrases, okay? And those clauses and phrases are made up of subjects and verbs um, and the object or predicate, adjective or predicate noun. So I'm going to be using the term clause and phrase over and over and over again as we do our diagram, as we break down sentences. So it's important that you understand what do we mean by that. And again, this is all by way of review. If you go back to session 9 and session 10 of unit 1, you can review the 
the video and the notes there, we covered this in detail. So I'm just reviewing this for you now since it's been several weeks. But a clause simply is defined as a group of words connected together that contain a subject and a verb. Okay, subject and a verb. So again, the one doing the action and then the action or the, the uh, description. All right, so a clause contains a subject and verb. So I hit. There's a subject and verb. So this is defined as a clause. All right. Now a phrase is simply a group of words connected together that don't have both a subject and a verb. So for example, with a stick, there's no verb here. So these are a group of words that are linked together, but there's no verb in this case. So this is not a clause. It's called a phrase in English. Okay. Now we can put these two together. I hit the ball with the stick. All right. So now I've got a clause. I hit the ball which is connected with the phrase uh, with the stick, all right? So we have a main sentence, a main subject and verb in this clause, which is, I hit the ball. That's a complete thought. And then added to that is this phrase with the stick to give more information. In this case, telling us how I hit the ball with the stick, all right? Okay, so let's go through a few examples together and then I'll just... Uh, call on different guys here to help us out. Uh, in these examples, I just want you to identify the subject and the verb. And then uh, also, if there is an object, uh, go ahead and identify that as well. All right, let me. And if there's an object or the predicate. Tim, we, we, we cannot see the screen. Oh. Sorry about I think it that. Dropped just now. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Can you see it now? Yep. Boy, just having lots of problems here. It's okay. Let me make sure also it's being recorded. No, okay, good. I think it's still being recorded. Okay. Well, this is what I was just showing <laughs> the clause in the phrase. <laughs> All right. That's what I was just talking about. Okay. So let's do some examples uh, together for this, all right? And again, just identify, uh, actually I want you to identify first whether it's a phrase or a clause. And then if it is a clause, you can identify the subject, verb, et cetera. All right, so again, remember for a clause, what are we looking for? A subject and a verb, all right? If it doesn't have those, it's not a clause, it's a phrase. All right, so uh, we'll start. Uh, Joshua, why don't you go ahead and just do the first one uh, for us. First, tell us, is it a phrase or a clause? And then if it is a clause, let us know what the subject and verb is. It's a clause and the subject is I. Subject is the, I. Yeah, the verb. Is a verb of action. Eight. I ate. Dinner is the object. Okay. Good. So that's just a simple clause, right? And it, and it presents a complete thought, by the way. I ate dinner. All right, good. All right, Norman, let me give this one to you. In the house. Do we have a phrase or a clause here? Mm, well, this is a phrase. Yeah. And why is it a phrase? Because uh, uh, it, it doesn't have a subject. Yeah, there's no subject or verb, is there? Mm, yeah. Okay. So again, Good, very good, Norman. When you're looking, I try to identify a phrase. Just remember a phrase. If you don't see a verb, or if you don't see a verb and its subject, you don't have a clause. You have a phrase. So that's all you guys need to look for uh, to know the difference. If you see a verb and a subject, you have a clause. All right. 
So since it's a phrase, there's no subject verb, so we don't have to. Uh, Norman, let me just ask you another one. How about this one? Ate with my friend. Is that a phrase or a clause? Uh, phrase. Okay. It's a phrase, but I have a verb here, ate. How come it's a phrase? Um, you have the friend. Friend, which is a verb. Okay. We have the, the verb is, uh, is eight here, okay? But you were correct to say this is a phrase, and why is it a phrase and not a clause? Even though we have a verb, we don't have a clause. Why don't we have a clause? What's, what subject. else is missing? Yes, very good. There's no subject, okay? The subject is somewhere else in the sentence. This is just a, a piece. Uh, but it's a phrase. Even though there's a verb, it's still a phrase because there's no subject and verb. Okay? There's an object, friend, uh, with my friend, but there's no subject. Okay? Good. That one was a little bit more tricky. Okay, thank you. Tanging, can you do this one? Tell me if we have here... Tanjin, if you have a phrase or a clause. It's a clause. Okay, how do you know? Uh, full subject, verb, and then uh, full sentence. Okay, so what's the subject? I. Good, the verb? Am, I am. And what kind of verb is that? Uh, beam. Action Very. of being, verb of being. Very good. All right. So what does that make yeah. full? What kind of word is full? Is uh like uh it is executive, so uh it modifies uh the verb, the sorry, the subject. Good. Yeah, it's a predicate adjective. So it's it's yeah. describing the subject I. Okay, and it's not yeah, a noun, yeah. so it must be an adjective. All right, very good. Let's yeah. let me give you one more. With my yeah. friend. Uh, it is uh, a phrase. Okay, and how do I know that? Because it's uh, like uh, no no verb here, no subject, but just phrase. Yes. Very good. Yeah, there's no verb or subject. Now, if I said he ate with my friend, this would be a clause, right? Because I supplied yeah. a subject and a verb. Yes. Okay. But just yeah. with my friend is a phrase. Yes. All right. Very good. Okay. Um, Zali, let me give you give you a turn here it's good to see you good evening good evening okay what do i have here zali do i have a phrase or a clause i think it's a clause okay why do you say that uh i'm not sure but it's it has a verb, obviously. And yes. What's the verb? Is. Okay. What kind of verb is that? A uh, verb of being. Very good. Now, to be a clause, we also need a subject. <clears throat> Do you see a subject here? I'm not sure who could be. Yes, it is. Go, go with, your, with your gut feeling. You're correct. <laughs> who who is a subject here it's it's called a pronoun but it is the subject of this sentence now we don't know who the who is referring to we would need more information but it is functioning as a subject here so what does that make pastor he's kind of uh Remember what we called that 
It's not an object because it's not receiving an action. There was another kind of uh, word that we described. Remember, an object uh, receives action. And then we had what we called the predicate adjective or noun. Oh, no. Yeah. This in case it's a predicate, and I'll just use the initials, predicate and noun. Okay. Excellent. Uh, let me give you one more. Okay. So sure. is everybody with us so far? Any questions on any of these that we've done so far? Okay. All right. So Ali, how about this one? With a pastor. Is that a phrase or a clause? No, uh, it's a phrase. And why do you say that? Because there is no subject or verb. Excellent. All right. Now, so here we have, again, uh, with no verb or subject. Now, if I had said um, uh, they talked with a pastor, I now have a clause because I have a subject today and a verb talked. But just with a pastor is a phrase by itself. Okay. All right. Excellent job. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go a step further now. We've talked about subjects, verbs, and then the object or the predicate, um, adjective, or noun. We've talked about um, clauses. And again, remember, a clause just simply has, contains a subject, right, and a verb. A phrase does not contain a subject and a verb. All right, so we've covered these so far. Now what I want to do is take us a little further and talk about clauses more. Now again, right now that this may not make sense what we're doing, but I'm trying, I'm building towards something here. It hopefully will make sense as we keep moving forward. So just Try to remember these particular terms, all right? Subject, verb, object, uh, predicate, adjective, or noun, clause, or phrase. Now, we can take clauses. There's, there's two different kinds of clauses, all right? There are those clauses which can stand alone and give a complete thought, and there are those clauses which cannot stand alone. They're dependent, all right? And so we refer to them as an independent clause, or a dependent clause. All right, so again, remember, a clause contains a subject and a verb, but as it turns out, there's two kinds of clauses. The independent clause makes a complete statement. I hit the ball. That's a complete thought, okay? But if the statement was, when I swung the bat, that's not a complete thought. And it's the reason is because of this word when. When is telling us that it's connected to something else. All right. It's not a complete thought because that word when it's telling us it's linked to something else that was said. And so this it is a clause because notice I have a subject. I. I have the verb swung. And in this case, I do also have an object, the bat. All right, so this is a clause, but it's dependent. There's a word that links it to something else. Okay, so for example, if this full sentence was, I hit the ball when I swung the bat, what I have here is I have an independent clause. I hit the ball. That's my complete thought. So I call it independent clause. And then when I swung the bat, is a dependent clause. Because this clause depends on the first one. Okay, because of that word when. So it's telling us when I hit the ball. Or how even. But it cannot stand alone. If I just had the sentence when I swung the bat, that doesn't stand by itself. Okay, so it's not independent, it's dependent. 
All right, any questions on that? We're going to go look at a couple examples here in a minute. Okay, so again, we're not talking about phrases here. There's not an independent phrase or a dependent phrase. There's just phrases. And again, phrases have no subject or verb and verb. But a clause can, there are two kinds of clauses. One that can stand by itself. It presents a complete thought. Um, we often call this independent clause, it's often called a main sentence. Okay. And then there's dependent clause. That cannot stand by itself, but it, it does contain a subject and a verb. So let's look at some examples. Hopefully that will help a little bit here. Okay. Uh, Paul, we'll give a couple to you here. All right. Just let us know here what kind of clause, what kind of clause is it? And then identify the subject, verb, and then object or the predicate. Okay. So first let us know what kind of clause do we have here? Independent or dependent? I ran home is independent. And stand alone. Yes. Good. The subject is I. The verb of action is ran. And the object of the action is home. All right. Good. It's a simple sentence. Only three words, but it does present a complete thought. It tells you a full action that took place. All right. How about this one? When it was dark, it's a dependent clause. All right. And, and what's the clue that tells you it's dependent? The, the, the word when. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. When is, is a word that tells us it's linked to something else. All right. Okay. What's the subject here? Just to... Uh, it. Okay. Good. Uh, verb is was, verb of being. All right. And All right. dark is the um, predicate noun. Yeah. Dark, I think actually is adjective in this case. You get adjective, okay. Is dark. Okay. Darkness would be a noun. All right, good. All right, let's... Let's keep going. Uh, Fu Wei, can we have you do this one? Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah. Good evening, by the way. Good to see you. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, good evening. <laughs> okay, so tell us what kind of a clause is this? Is it independent or dependent? Mm, should be independent clause. Very good. It's independent can stand by itself. It presents a complete thought. Hmm. Okay, so can you let us know what the subject and verb is? Okay, the uh, subject is he. And the uh, verb should be is. What kind of verb is that? Is it action uh, or being? Being. Very good. It's describing his state or there's something about him. Okay, so what about friend? What is that here? Uh, so be predicate, uh, predicate nouns. Very good. Yes, because again, remember, it's it's not an object because there's no action taking place. So it must be that that predicate, adjective, or noun. And friend is a noun. Okay. Great job. All right. Let me give you one more here. He is happy. Is that independent or dependent? Uh, independence cross. Very good. And go ahead and let me know uh, subject and verb. Subject is he. Then the word is is. Uh, word of well being. Yeah, we can have that. So what does that make happy? What is how will we describe happy here? 
the predicate object uh, adjective. Very good. Yeah, it's not a noun. We don't have an action here, so it's not an object. So it must be a predicate adjective. It's describing the subject. All right, you're doing so well, Fui. I'm going to give you one more. All right, how about this one? Who was happy? It's not a question, by the way. This is a, a statement. So is this independent or dependent? Okay, uh, so the independent, independent process, process. Okay, it looks like independent, mm. doesn't it? But let me, let me give you a full sentence and then you, I'll ask you. So, um, Pastor Joshua, who was happy, um, let's see took a nap. Now notice here, Pastor Joshua took a nap. That's an independent statement. That can stand alone. But who was happy actually functions as a dependent clause here. Okay, it doesn't stand alone because we don't know the who. Who is a subject, but it's an undefined subject by itself. It needs something else to tell us who the who is. Okay? So in this case, it actually is a dependent clause. Because we don't know who the who is until we have more information. Okay? So in this case, who was happy is a, a dependent clause. And so I, if you see it in a sentence, hopefully that makes more sense. That the independent clause is, Pastor Joshua took a nap, and then inserted between it is this dependent clause that tells us something about Pastor Joshua. Okay, it's describing him, but because of that word who, that word who is undefined. It needs more information to tell us what it's referring to. All right, so this one was a little bit tricky uh, here. And these are hard to, uh, to do as exercises because usually we, we want a, um, a full sentence or paragraph to be able to give a context here, all right? So these are just uh, basic exercises looking at just one phrase or clause here, okay? All right, so Let's um, let me summarize this, and then I'm going to give you you all an exercise to do using a passage of scripture. Okay. So, again, a sentence will always contain an independent clause. All right, it's not a sentence if it does not have an independent clause. That is, it is not a sentence if it does not have a standalone, a subject and verb and usually object or predicate adjective or noun that stands alone, okay? So a sentence will always contain an independent clause, and then usually a sentence will have additional phrases and clauses, okay? So you can think of it this like this equation. A sentence will have an independent clause, and then often it has additional phrases. Again, the, remember, those are words grouped together that have no verb and subject. So a sentence often has independent clause with phrases and then also dependent clauses. Other groups of words that have a subject and verb but depend on or connected to something else in the sentence. They don't stand alone. Okay, so here's an example. Pastor Joshua preached a sermon. Okay, that's an independent clause, right? I have a subject, Joshua. I have a verb preached, I have an object, sermon, and in this case, this is a, a complete thought. I could say Pastor Joshua preached a sermon, and that gives a complete idea. Now, it's followed by a phrase, with great passion. Again, there's no subject in that phrase or verb, so it's a phrase, and it modifies how Pastor Joshua preached. 
I have another phrase, at church. And again, that phrase is a phrase because there's no verb and subject, and it modifies preached as well. It's telling me where Pastor Joshua preached. In the morning. Again, is a phrase, no verb and subject, and it's telling me when Pastor Joshua preached. And then another group of words here, when it was cold. Now, in this case, we have a clause because there's a verb, was, and there's a subject, it. But this does not stand alone because of that word when. That word when is linking it was cold to something else in the sentence. And in this case, it's linking it to when Pastor Joshua preached. Okay? So, this is how I would diagram this passage, so to speak. All right, this is a diagram, a block diagram of the passage. And now notice, this is why I'm talking to you about phrases and clauses, because we have to see each of these, because each phrase or clause represents a, a, an idea or some, gives some information within the sentence. So Pastor Joshua, again, preached a sermon. That's my independent clause. That's my main thought, the main sentence, if you will. Now, with great passion, notice I put it underneath preached because it's describing how Pastor Joshua preached. It's telling me something about the action. At church, that's telling me where he preached. Okay, at church is not modifying sermon. It's not telling me something about the sermon, and it's not telling me something about Pastor Joshua. It's telling me something about his action, where he preached, in the morning. That's when he preached. And again, that's modifying the verb preached. All right? Now, when it was cold could modify preached. It could tell us when he preached, or it could be describing the morning, what kind of morning it was. And that's why I put it under morning. It's telling us what kind of morning. Okay? So this is just an example of these phrases and clauses that are um, connected in some way within the sentence. You have a main thought, and then you have additional phrases and clauses which provide more information, but they're modifying certain parts of, of the sentence. And so if you were to preach this, so to speak, or if you were to teach it, what you would say is the main thought would be Pastor Joshua preached a sermon, and then you would have three subpoints that modify the, the, the word preached. We have a point number one, which is how he preached. Point two would be where he preached, and point three would be when he preached. Okay? This is exactly what we'll do with a passage of Scripture. We identify the main clause, we identify the other phrases and clauses, and then we figure out how do those fit? Where do they connect? And as you do that, you will see an outline of the passage forming. And that's the outline then that will carry over into your sermon. That's the structure. Okay? For example, you guys know this passage. Um, uh, go, therefore, well, here, let's do this. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Anyone recognize this passage? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or obey all that I commanded you. All right? We know this text, right? Great Commission. 
Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Now, it is very helpful to uh, see how this passage breaks down. What exactly did uh, Christ... Let me see here. Let's do this. How does this, this passage... Uh, how did he, oops, sorry, connect all these phrases and clauses? So we have, first he begins with an independent clause. All authority has been given to me. Where was this authority given? In heaven and on earth, okay? Or... Um, I think actually the translation I used uh, is actually this one, in heaven and on earth. I think the ESV has that, has been given to me. Let me use that. That's a little easier to... No, uh, we'll, we'll go with the original. Okay, so where has it been given? All right, that's the first independent clause here all authority has been given to me and then there's some description of where it was given in heaven and on earth now we could discuss also the possibility it's which authority authority in heaven and authority on earth but let's just go with this go therefore and that's a command make disciples those are two parallel statements that are complete thoughts go it's a complete thought it's a command Go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them Let me just do this and then I'll, I'll and teaching them. To observe, and then finally he says, I forgot the last end, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is another independent statement. Okay, so here's my diagram of Matthew 28. All right. Matthew 28 contains essentially three independent clauses. All authority has been given to me. Go and make disciples. I am with you always. So if you were preaching this text, there's three points. If you're preaching the entire passage, Jesus first gives uh, uh, his, his declaration. Then secondly, he gives his command. And then thirdly, he gives his promise. Okay, you see that? Jesus is making three main statements here, three ideas within the Great Commission. First, he declares all authority has been given to him. Then he gives a command in response to that, make disciples. Then he gives his promise. I'm with you always. Now, the second part, <clears throat> the command, there's, there's detail here, but notice there's two sub points under this. First, how do we make disciples? One, baptizing. And then two, teaching okay <clears throat> so here's your <clears throat> excuse me here's the basic outline for the great commission just following the rules of grammar identifying phrases and clauses and then i noting where those phrases and clauses what they modify all right and we'll as we go through this process I'll be teaching you how to put this diagram together. But when you do that, notice the outline comes right out. Okay. 
Here's my first point. <clears throat> my second point. And my third point, <clears throat> I am with, whoops, I forgot the U here. Okay, and then if I want substructure, <clears throat> I've got two subpoints under the second one. Okay, how I make disciples, baptizing and teaching. All right, so this is... <clears throat> This is where we're going. This is why I'm going through the exercise of uh, um, with all this terminology that we're using and this the grammar that we're discussing. But uh, does is there any questions on this? Uh, hopefully, this makes a little bit of sense. Uh, again, I didn't tell you how I came up with all of these. Um, you know, all of these, the structure here, but <clears throat> we're going to be learning principles where I'll show you how to do that. But I'm just following the, the rules of grammar here to unfold, to expose the, the main ideas that the author's expressing, in this case, Jesus. He's giving us three main statements. And with those, he gives some phrases and clauses which modify those statements. All right. And this is what then gives us Jesus's outline, if you will, all right? He doesn't tell us, okay, here's my outline. First, I want to say this, and second, I'm going to say this, and third, I will say this. Uh, he didn't do it that way. He just says it. And then, But we, knowing that Jesus is using the rules of grammar, we can uh, uh, unpack or dissect what he said to understand his structure. And that's what we're doing. Okay, every didactic passage, every instructional passage will have this, and you'll be able to uncover the, the author's outline, really. And so then you can directly transfer. So my sermon would be, um, you know, three, three components to the Great Commission that we need to understand in order to fulfill Christ's purpose for the church, something like that. The first component is his declaration. The second is his command. The third is his promise. All three of these, by the way, men, are important when you talk about the Great Commission. Don't just focus on the second part, the command, make disciples. That certainly is at the heart of the Great Commission, but we have to remember first, it is a command. So don't forget what Jesus said. I have all authority here. So you need to go do this based on my authority. We can't forget that. That gives uh, emphasis uh, to the command that Jesus gives. And then don't forget the promise. All right? The Great Commission is not easy. And Jesus gives a promise, I'm with you. That can be very helpful and very encouraging. So remember, in this text, we have three statements Jesus makes, not just one. And then, in focus, in the, as you discuss that second part, his command, don't forget the substructure here is very important because it tells us what he means by when he says make disciples, because he tells us here how to do that. First, bring them to Christ, conversion. Second, Show, you know, uh, show them his example. Teach them about Christ and what he has said. That's sanctification. Okay? All right. Questions? Comments? It's, it's very, very clear. It makes, it makes the Great Commission. I mean, you, you took it from Matthew chapter 28, the last three verses. If, if we just read the passage, uh, yeah, sometimes we can just like look at a, a, 
a group of words without any clear division of what Christ is giving in that great commission. But after, yeah, after like diagramming, you can see clearly uh, what Christ is actually commanding the church to do. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Yeah, <clears throat> again, there, there, because this is instructional from Jesus, he's giving instruction. There, there will be structure to it. Um, could do another example here. I'll try anyway. This is uh, really Paul's expression of the Great Commission in a different way here, but it's the same idea. Okay, let me just, I'll diagram this one for you, just again to show you another example. So we proclaim him. That's the independent clause. Okay, that's the, the complete thought. There's a subject and a verb. It presents a complete thought. We proclaim Jesus. How we proclaim, admonishing every man and teaching every man. How do we teach? With all wisdom. And then why do we proclaim him? So that we may present every man complete in Christ. And then why do we want to present every man, or why does Paul labor? Because he wants to present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose, I'll just do this. I won't be able to fit all that here. Okay, so here's another example of a diagram where we have the main statement is we proclaim him. But notice there's modifying statements. How do we proclaim him? We admonish and teach every man. Why do we proclaim him? So that we may present every man complete in Christ. Okay, if you're preaching verse 28, you're going to have one, there's a main idea and there's, Three sub points. Okay. How are we proclaiming him? So when Paul says we proclaim him, what does he mean? He means one, we proclaim Christ admonishing, that's instructing uh, every man uh, with warning. And then secondly, how do we proclaim him teaching every man? with all wisdom. And then the third sub point is why do we proclaim him? This was what drove Paul. This was his motivation to present every man complete in Christ or mature. And that is what his motivation was to labor. He wanted it to present every man mature. This is why he says, I labor. How does he labor? According to his power. Which power? The power that works mightily in him. Okay, but again, notice there's structure here. And that structure is identified by grammar, by understanding what the words here. He's got a participle here that tells how he proclaims, another participle that tells how he proclaims, and then this so that. It's called a subordinating conjunction that tells why. Okay? And you can do this, you know, with any passage, uh, any epistle, uh, any instructional passage. You can do this with poetry. Poetry has this kind of structure as well. Even though there's figurative language, it's instructional. There's structure to it, all right? So you can break it down as well. And when you do that, that's where an outline emerges. That's where the structure of the passage is made clear, all right? So this is worth the diagramming 
leads us to, to, to see the text, to see the author's intended meaning from the text and how the author structured the passage. Okay? All right. Now, if any of this, you know, doesn't make sense, I'm just trying to give you a glimpse or a picture of where we're headed. All right? So we're going to cover all the details of how, how do you know this phrase modifies this phrase or this clause is under this word? How do you know that? Well, that's what we're going to cover together as we move forward. All right? But this is the end goal is to see the author's structure. And then from that, we now know the author's intent. And so from that, then, we can preach the passage to our hearers, understanding the author's structure. We now explain it to our audience so that they understand and can apply it. Okay? Questions on that? Before, I'm going to give you an exercise here in a minute. I hope these examples helped, helped a little bit to show you where we're headed. Okay. Any questions on these two examples from Matthew 28 or Colossians 1? How do you tell whether this, um, this phrase is a how or whether that phrase is a why? I guess that is something that I don't quite understand because I don't understand poem, poems. I, I don't write poems. Okay. And then, now in this case, this is from an epistle. This is a... Uh, Colossians 1, okay, so this is a, it sounds poetic, but actually this passage is, is a, from an epistle. Uh, the way we determine, like admonishing and teaching, how do I know that that's describing how? We'll talk about that. These two words, admonishing and teaching, are called participles, and participles tell us either how something is done or they tell us um, sometimes when something is done, or they tell us the result of something that is done. Okay? So that's, I know it's how based on the fact that this word is a participle. It's a certain kind of word that, um, that tells me either how, it tells me um, the result. And then so that is called a subordinating conjunction and I know that it functions as a purpose statement or it functions as a um, result, okay? So it's just by knowing what kind of, uh, what so that means. I could have said also, sometimes you'll see in order that, or you'll see as a result, something like that, okay? So we'll talk about more um, as we move forward, I'll give you an explanation for that there are different kinds of words that introduce a phrase or a clause, and those words uh, give us the how they work, what they do. And a participle, how it works, is it often tells us either how something is done or it tells us um, the result of something that is done, or it tells us another action taking place with the main action. But by definition, a participle, these words that are a verb with an ing ending, by definition, they modify something else. They don't stand alone. They're not independent. Okay? And that's probably about all I could answer right now. Uh, we'll have to wait till we get there for you to get more details. But... I know how, how a phrase or clause functions by the word that introduces it. That gives me the clue. Just like, for example, if I were to say, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, I know heaven and earth are locations, right? That's a place. And... I know that when you talk about a place, that's usually a where. It's a location. Whenever you have the question where something happens, that's modifying the verb. That's modifying the action. Okay? 
If it's a location, it's, it's answering the question where. And in this case, where has that authority been given? In heaven and on earth. Okay, so again, that's why I, I know, though that because of in and on, those are usually terms that describe a location. Those are prepositions that describe a location. Okay. Now I'm getting way ahead of myself, but um, I'm just trying to show you there is a clue within these words that that connect the phrase or clause. There's a clue as to how they work in the sentence. All right. So I hope that's enough, Michael, to at least give you some idea. Okay. Any other questions? Tim, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, indentation? Why I indented? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the reason for that, thank you, that's a good question. The reason for that is in a diagram, you indent under the word that you're modifying, that that's being modified. So in this case, proclaim is the word that's being modified by admonishing every man, teaching every man, so that we may present every man. So I put all of these under proclaim because they all modify proclaim. They're telling us something about the action. Okay, now with all wisdom, I put under teaching because it's describing how, how he taught with all wisdom. So I put it under teaching or we may present every man complete in Christ. And, and then this is in a sense where we present. So I indent the clause or the phrase right under the word that it's modifying. That's how I know here. Okay. One, I have my three sub points under proclaim because all of these, these three uh, phrases in this case, or this is a phrase, this is a phrase, this is a clause. Each of them, maybe I should do this. There, I'll do it that way. Okay, so each of these three, um, two phrases, one clause, they all modify the action proclaim. And so I put them under the, that, and then also, too, then they tell us um, the, as we put together, as we see the outline here, they tell us these are three sub points under the main point. The main point, we proclaim him. And then the three sub points. And we see that visually by indenting each phrase and clause under the word it's modifying. Okay. All right. Okay, let's, uh, let's see. We just have some time to do this exercise. Here's what I'd like you guys to do. Uh, I put together, we're not going to be able to go through the whole thing here, but this is what I did is I took Philip Philemon 4 through 7, uh, 4 through 16, and I highlighted every phrase and clause. Okay? So, and I just did alternating colors so you could see. So for example, I thank my God always is a phrase or a clause. When I remember you, phrase or clause. So I just, each of these highlighted statements are a phrase or a clause. So what I want you to do, and here's the exercise, is indicate if the highlighted statement is a phrase or a clause. If it's a clause, tell us if it's independent or dependent. And also identify the subject, verb, object, or, or predicate, adjective, or noun. Okay? So it's, it's exactly what we did in the examples earlier. I want you to do this for a passage now. So let me just, I'll explain the first uh, couple of verses, and then you guys are going to do as many as we can get through in the next, you know, 20, 20 minutes or so. Okay? So, for example, I thank my God always. That is a, an independent clause. 
because it presents a complete thought. There's a subject and a verb. I is a subject, a verb is think. God is the object. Now, always, if we go back, remember, always is actually an adverb here, modifying think. It's telling us when, I think. Okay, but I thank my God always is an independent clause. Now, when I remember you is dependent. Again, we have that word when, so that tells us it's depending on something else in the sentence. And in this case, it is when I thank my God. Subject is I, verb is remember, object is you. The next group of words is a phrase because there's no verb in my prayers. So I just put phrase. There's no subject or verb, so I don't note that. Verse five, because I hear of your love is a dependent clause. How do I know that? The word because. That's telling me this clause, I hear of your love, is dependent on something else in the sentence. That word because shows us that. And here, and of the faith is also, there's two objects here of your love and of the faith, two objects of the verb here, here of, okay? So this is a dependent clause. Another dependent clause that you have, that is, or you is the subject, have is the verb, but it's dependent because of that word that, all right? toward the Lord Jesus Christ, toward the Lord Jesus. That is a phrase, there's no verb. For all the saints, that is a phrase, there's no verb. Okay? Does this exercise make sense? All right, so um, let's do this then. I'll just keep this on the screen if you want to you know, copy it down or whatever. Um, just follow the pattern I gave you. Identify below if it's a, a clause or a phrase and whether it's dependent or independent clause. And then above the words, just note if it's a clause, note the subject verb, an object or predicate adjective or nominative, okay? Maybe I'll try to shrink it a little bit. Master so, Tim. Yes, sir. Did you say that you, you use green color for the clauses and yellow for the phrases? No. Is that what you did? I just, oh, no. okay. I used green and yellow to distinguish between uh, each phrase or clause could be either green or yellow. I just, uh, oh. so for example, notice up here, I just put yellow, I started with yellow, and that happened to be independent clause. Then I did green, that happened to be a dependent clause. Then I did yellow, that's a phrase. Then I did green, so I was just trying to distinguish between each group of words. So yeah, um, thank you for the question. So green does not mean it's a phrase or a clause. It's just a group of words that go together and they could be either a phrase or a clause. All right, so just see if we can get through these verses here. I'll just put them a little closer together. So you can do. Okay, any other questions? All right, go ahead and take a few minutes. I'll give you maybe 10 minutes or so and do as many as you can. So in a few minutes, I'll scroll up. Well, as they would say when you're taking tests, everyone put down your pencils. And <laughs> um, actually, of course, this wasn't a test, but an exercise. And I'll give you, uh, when I publish the notes, when I send out the notes, uh, when I put them on Canvas, I'll 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 do uh, put down what I have for the whole passage, so you'll be able to you can finish all these verses, verses four through uh, sixteen.
try to do it on your own, finish up the whole passage, and then you can look at the handout that I provide and, and see what I put, okay? But let's just go through as much as we can in the next uh, uh, few minutes, cover that together. Uh, Pastor Philip, I'm going to start with you, verse 6. This long group of words, I pray that your faith may become effective. Is that a clause or a phrase? Uh, it is clause. Okay, good. What kind? Is it dependent or independent? Uh, a independent clause. Okay. It can stand alone. Correct. I pray that yes. the sharing of your faith may become effective. Um, what is the subject and the verb? Uh, subject, I. Okay. And the verb? I is the subject and verb is pray is the verb of action. Okay, good. And object is like that. Um, the sharing of your faith. Yes, this whole thing is the object. All right. Yes. Uh, because it's introduced by this word that it's what he prays. It's the content of his prayer. I pray that. Now, technically, the sharing of your faith is a dependent clause. Mm. Okay? Um, yeah. so, so, technically, we have this. But I, I didn't want to confuse anybody at, at the beginning. But I pray is the independent clause. And then the, the sharing of your faith is a dependent clause connected with the word that. Okay? Yes. But... I was trying to simplify it a little bit, but yeah, very, very good uh, observation. This whole clause is actually the object, all right, of pray. Pray that, and then the content is the object there. All right, Pastor Philip, can you do one more? For the full knowledge. What is that? Is that a phrase or a clause? Yes, it is a phrase because there is no subject or verb. Good. No verb, no subject. So it's a it's phrase. Yeah. So, um, okay, one, one more. You're on a roll here. So <laughs> this next, yeah. of every good thing. What is it? also phrase. Phrase. No subject and no verb. Excellent. Very good. Okay, uh, Mike. Let's have you take the next couple here. That is in us. What is is that a phrase or a clause? A phrase. Okay. Now look in it. Do we have a verb and a subject or not? Yeah. Um, the subject is is truncated. Um, it's a truncated statement. So because it's that is in us. So I consider that as a phrase because you have a that in front. Okay. Now, in this case, the, the word that is functioning as a, a pronoun here. Oops. So it, it is actually a subject of this. Okay. Uh, it may not look like one, but actually we do have a clause here because this, there is the verb is and the subject of the verb is is the word that, okay? Um, you could think of which. Another way to say this would be which is in us, okay? It's the same idea, same type of word. So that that is a pronoun which can function as a subject. So uh, we do have a clause here, even though it may not look like one. Uh, which subject is, is the verb, and then... What kind of clause is this then? Is it dependent or independent? Uh, dependent clause. Yeah. That word, the word that, which you noted, tells us it's, it's dependent. 
it's connected to something else. And in this case, it's connected to thing. Which thing? The thing that is in us. Okay, how about for the sake? Uh, it's, a, it's a phrase. Very good. And how do I know it's a phrase? Um, for the for? Yeah, is there, remember, for, for that, we're just looking for a verb and a subject. Yeah, so there is no, uh, there's no subject. There's no subject here. Correct. No verb, no subject. So it's a phrase. How about the next one, of Christ? Is that a phrase or a clause? Um, that is a clause. Okay, do you see a verb? Uh, yeah, I see a verb here. So, is, uh, of. Okay. Of, that's normally, um, acts like it, it's called a preposition. So in this case, it's not a verb here. It's actually a preposition. So in this, in this, uh, these two words of Christ is, is a phrase because there's no, there's no verb here. Okay. Of is called a preposition in this case. All right. Any questions on that from anybody? So notice so far, we have one independent clause back up in verse four. And now, uh, and then we have dependent clause phrases. And then we have a second independent clause in verse nine. And then it's followed by phrases and dependent clauses. All right. Uh, Joshua, let me Sorry, give you the next next one here. What's the difference between phrase and uh, dependent clause? Oh, okay. Good question. Uh, let me find a space here. Let me just go back to when we define those. Oh, I thought it was. Okay, here we go. Um, well, first we have the basic difference between a clause and a phrase. Okay, a clause is a group of words containing or which have um, a subject and a verb. Okay, that's a clause. A phrase is simply a group of words that do not have a subject and a verb, okay? Now a clause, there's two kinds. There's an independent clause, and that is uh, a complete thought, it can stand alone, and then a dependent clause is, uh, cannot stand, alone depends on another word in the sentence okay so the difference between a phrase and a dependent clause is really the phrase has no subject and verb okay and a dependent clause has a subject and a verb but it can't stand alone it's not a complete thought that's an independent clause okay does that make sense or answer your question or so what we're doing in this exercise is we're doing two things here first we're identifying if the group of words that i've highlighted is a phrase or a clause and so to do that just simply look for a verb and a subject if you don't see a verb and a subject you have a phrase all right, if you have a clause, you'll see a verb and a subject, and then you simply need to just identify that subject and verb. So for example, in the next one, we have a clause here, okay? Uh, for I have derived much comfort, so I see a subject, I, and have derived is a verb. 
the object is, notice there's two objects here, joy and comfort. And so this is a clause and it's an independent clause because it can stand alone. I have derived much joy and comfort. All right, that's a complete thought. From your love is a phrase. I don't, there's no verb here. So it has to be a phrase. My brother, no verb, phrase. Okay, now we'll finish with this one and I'm gonna have Joshua do this this one because uh, it's a little more complicated here. And Joshua's our English grammar expert. So uh, Joshua, we're gonna have you finish out verse seven. All right. And there's, uh, a, there's a little trick here, so. Because the hat uh, dependent clause. Okay, um, so where's my verb? Have been refreshed. Yeah, what's happened here? There's a phrase inserted. In the yes, middle. that's the tricky part on this one. <laughs> so, uh, Josh was exactly right. This is a dependent clause, and the clause is because the hearts have been refreshed. So let me do this. I'm going to highlight it in a different color. Oops. So hopefully you can see that. Let's do this. All right, here we have an example where, as Joshua said, a phrase was inserted in the middle of a clause. Okay, because the hearts have been refreshed, that is the clause. And of the saints was put in the middle of it to modify hearts. Okay, which hearts? The hearts of the saints. So we're going to see that from time to time in English, often you will see a, a phrase or another clause inserted in the middle of a clause, all right? Now, the reason is because if you put of the saints at the end here, if we, if we keep the clause, because the hearts have been refreshed, of the saints doesn't make sense. It doesn't connect to refreshed. Of the saints goes with hearts. So that's why it's written right after hearts. But we have to pay attention because notice it split the clause, just like Pastor Joshua said. Okay, how about through you, Joshua? What is that? Uh, phrase? Yes. There's no verb. Okay. Now, uh, next Next time we gather, next week, uh, Lord willing, uh, we on next Tuesday night, we'll, we'll do a couple more verses. And then uh, what I want to do is show you how, how do I know, so how do I know this is the phrase? How do I know this is a clause? Uh, how, how, do, how did I decide what words to group together? Well, that is identified by what are called connector words. A connector word is what identifies or defines a phrase or a clause. All right? So next week, we're going to learn that. We're going to learn how do we know that, okay, this is, this is a group of words together. In this case, it's a clause. And then from you is a phrase. How come it's not from you for a while? Why, don't I, why didn't I group it together that way? Well, because this word for is a connector word. So it tells me I have a new phrase. Okay? So that's what's coming uh, next week, Lord willing. And then again, I'll, I'll publish the notes and I'll, I'll put the answers for all of these so you can see, the, see them for the rest of the verses and compare to what what you did, but it's very, very important. In diagramming, we have to be able to identify the phrases and the clauses, because that's what we will, will determine um, what word is being modified and how it's modifying that word, okay? 
All right. Well, I wish we had a little more time, but um, our time has run out and uh, we'll continue on in this in the coming uh, week, next week as well. And I'll have the video, Lord willing, posted for you in the next couple of days that you can review if you have any questions. Okay. Are any, any, any uh, last questions or, or comments before, uh, before we go? Did you say the word for, like in verse seven, for, uh, whenever you have a, the word for in the beginning, uh, it means that this is the new independent clause. What you were saying? Uh, yeah, uh, that word for is a connector word, and it's connecting to something previously, but it is presenting a new thought. It's independent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like therefore, um, be another example. Okay. And we'll talk about that. Um, and when we look at the connector words, there's different kinds. There's conjunctions. There's prepositions. There's pronoun, relative pronouns, participles. Those all are, are connector words that identify the next phrase or clause in the sentence. All right. Okay. Uh, Pastor Philip, I know you said your signal was a little uh, rough, but would you uh, be able to, to close us in prayer? Yes. Can you hear me? Faster? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So shall we pray? Thank you.